Mabel, Mabel, Ma Mabel. Hi, yes. Yes, Mabel, the job. That's right. You count us down and then we begin. Yeah, yeah, like every time. And by when I say like every time, I don't mean me doing your job for you every time. I mean, you count us down because you're the stage manager and that's your jam. <laughs> Somebody wake her up. <laughs> I'll do it in five. Where you been, Joe? We're tuning in for the talk show every week, Joe. You're not having one every week, Joe. Yeah, I know. Cool it. I'm doing my best, sometimes. I've been busy. I was out of town at a corporate gig up in Walnut Creek. That's in Northern California. It's about a five-hour drive, or when I do it, seven. Next day, I had to be down in Palmdale at noon. Palmdale's almost all the way back to Los Angeles because I was in another show, this sort of improvised show for kids and families about Christmas. Made for a long weekend, but hey, got to perform, made a few bucks, good times, good people, glad to do it. I did recording at uh, a theater here in, in North Hollywood for Sirius XM Radio, for play on Sirius XM Radio. Key distinction, there's no guarantee it's going to be on Sirius. A bunch of us got together, rent, I rented the theater, I put in a little lineup together of, of good comedians, and we each did our best 15 minutes, and hopefully pieces of it will get on Sirius XM Radio, and we can start making a few bucks from it, because... That's, that's the entire point of art. I think we all agree, money. I uh, had another gig, got paid to do some ADR on a thing that should be airing on a cable station near you pretty soon. Hopefully you'll see me on one cable station. I can't even say which one yet. It's, it should air any day. It may have started for all I know, but I, I really shouldn't say until it actually starts airing. And yet, sometimes my emotions are up and down. I had trouble sleeping the last few days. Eh, eh. You know, just trying to get in touch with what we want. What, what, do you, what do you want in life? Why are you here? What do you, you know, plan it's a blank check. Make yourself something. And still, we stumble. We don't know what to do. I still do that. I have a really cool guest this week. Her name's Alyssa Bika. She is a comedian and an actor. And her thing, she's a sommelier. Like, for real. She talks about her journey, how she was working at a high-end restaurant, and that led to a thing, which led to another thing, but she stepped up and asked. That was the thing. She's like, look, this is a thing I like. I'm going to ask about it. I'm going to apply myself. And ding, the universe just kind of said, okay, here you go. And now she's a sommelier. I mean, I, I don't, it took longer than, you know, two sentences there, but you get the idea. It's another example of a person just applying themselves and going after the thing that they like. We learn a few things, learn about some things about wine that the average person can do when you're shopping for wine. That was pretty enlightening. Also learned that uh, she had a taste in as, as a child. Not a taste for wine. Now, let's not go there. But uh, she didn't eat the foods that the other kids ate. She talks about that. And I think the seeds for her refined palate were probably planted in childhood. And I, I think it's a cool interview. And she's cool. And if you're in L.A., go visit uh, the restaurant she works at. 71 Above. It's the top of the U.S. Bank building, High Rise, in Los Angeles. And I'm going to stop talking now so I can start talking. I'm trying to remember where we first met. It may have been Flappers, because that's where every comedian in Los Angeles meets each other. Probably, yeah. I, I did do stand-up for about five years, but that was a couple, I haven't in a couple years. So, I don't know, probably five, six years ago we met. I'm thinking there. there, or was it some show, somebody ran a show on La Brea, like by 7th or 8th in that little coffee house. Did you ever do that one? I, I mean, I did like so many coffee houses and all the clubs and all the open mics. So that's also possible. Okay. Well, wherever it was, hello again. Hello. <laughs> um, let's get started. Where are you from originally? I, I'm originally from Medina, Ohio. It's like 30 minutes south of Cleveland, between like Cleveland, Akron area. And did you, were you in, did you go the performing arts track as a child or? Yes. Yeah, so I have a very useless degree, a BFA in acting um, <laughs> from Ohio University. And yeah, then I went after that, I moved to New York for a couple of years. I did like another on camera film 
school. Um, and then I moved to LA in 2008. So I've been out here for quite a while. And it was but, all in pursuit of uh, film, television, and possibly yeah. theater. Yes. Yeah. Which like acting, hmm? acting and writing, that kind of. And yeah. then it explains the foray into stand up. Yeah. I mean, I did stand up. It was one of those things. I did stand up because, like, I guess my dream acting job would have been on a sitcom. Um, so I was like, oh, this is, a, or a dream writing job would be to write on a sitcom. So I was like, okay, this is a good way to get myself out there. Um, but I don't know if the actual art of stand-up was ever my personal end goal. It was more like a, a stepping stone type thing. And it got to the point where I was like, well, I can just focus on the writing part, which is what I really like, and then make some room for some other things. So that's kind of why I transitioned out of that. And you know, it, it's, it's, I found that also, you can't do everything. And if you do, yeah. you can't do it all well. Yeah, yeah. Unless you're Donald Glover. <laughs> That guy makes me feel like a piece of crap because he does a lot of things and he does all of them really well. And I'm just going, why should I bother? So, right. But yeah. Or you got to be really rich and have like a million assistants to do everything for you. So yeah. Since neither of those are my realities. <laughs> here we are. So the whole time you were out here in LA uh, pursuing acting and writing, but you had some kind of day work also, correct? Yeah. So um, I was serving like every other actor comedian whatever in the city and I was I had a fairly good paying job for eight years I worked at the Beverly Hills Hotel I was a server there um but it was so draining and not really what I wanted to be doing um and so I mean it, the the benefit of that was it was a day serving job so I had my nights free and that's when I was doing a lot of stand-up and and whatnot um but then when I transitioned out of stand up and I was like, okay, I, I actually write the best during the day. Um, I like to just get up first thing and write. And then at night, I tend to be able to do the mindless, like serving type jobs. But I was like, okay, so let me transition to a night job. But I didn't want to serve again. And I had at the time been at Beverly Hills Hotel for eight years. Um, I'd always really liked wine. And I, I had zero credentials except that I liked wine and I became like one of the captain servers. So I would train the new servers and I just started training people on the wine. And like whenever reps would come and do workshops at the hotel, I'd always be asking them a lot of questions. I had one rep at one point say, oh, you should be a wine rep. Like you'd be really good at it. And that was the first time I ever thought about, oh, maybe I should like study wine or get into like sommelier um took me a couple years uh, like two years probably later when I actually started doing it but the seed kind of got planted um and then luckily it sounds weird luckily I got laid off from the hotel and so I had like a little bit of like downtime where I was on unemployment and I was like trying to explore writing acting all these different things and somewhere in there I was like oh why don't I take my level one some exam um i've done there's a couple different ones you can see w set a lot of people do w set which is more of an academic type wine program um but court of master sommeliers is more catered towards actual like sommeliers that work restaurant floors um now, now as a sommelier you have to have a nose and a palate for wines you have to identify that because i saw the documentary some yeah and if you haven't seen it folks it's it's terrifying i mean the level of scrutiny that <laughs> aspiring sommeliers are put under a microscope. It's insane how, yeah. how specific they have to get. And I'm, I'm thinking, okay, well, you, you, for, I mean, of course you can study these things and learn about them, but you mm -hmm. must have had a sensitive palate along the way. Did you, as a child, were you a, a fussy eater? Could you, could you eat Halloween candy and say, oh, this was on the truck too long. I can tell the sugars crystallized a little bit. I mean, how good was your palate when you were younger? I mean, I think, okay, one, I will say I can teach anyone to develop their palate. I will say that number one, but number two, uh, I always liked food and wine. I was that weird kid where if we went to dinner, I did not want the grilled cheese or the mac and cheese. I wanted the rack of lamb. Um, my mom said one time we went on a Disney cruise and I was eight, like all my cousins and my sister, they're eating like off the kid menu. And my mom said, I looked at her like in like, I was horrified and I was like, do I have to order off this menu? And she's like, no. <laughs> so I was getting like crab cakes and like shrimp cocktail at like 
eight. So I, I've always naturally just liked good food, liked flavors. It's always been my thing. Um, as far as I always liked wine, I loved wine tasting. I knew what I liked, but it wasn't until I actually started studying um, that you really do realize all of these nuances and differences. And then it's like anything you have to train. So it's like a gym for your nose and your mouth, right? So if people are saying, for instance, a Cabernet Sauvignon or a Sauvignon Blanc has what's called pyrazines, there, there's different components that different grapes have. And pyrazines is a green bell pepper, jalapeno, like grassy component. So I would buy bell peppers and I would cut them up and I would smell them and I would have a Cabernet Sauvignon and I would try to find it. It's easier to find in old world wines like Bordeaux because it's cooler climate. In Napa, everything seems to be quite fruity, but I would sit there and I'd smell it. If they say Italian wines have like dried oregano or thyme, like who really knows what thyme and oregano and sage smell like off the top of your head. So I would buy all of those herbs. I would smell them. Um, if you're identifying American oak, a lot of times dill is a component. I would buy dill. I'd buy dill, I'd get a Rioja that is American oak. I'd smell it. So like those kind of things. If you, if you did that regularly, you could train yourself to pick up more stuff. So it's like the language of aromas. Mm -hmm. you're, just, you're just figuring out the language. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. And I don't, how do these, I mean, let's get into the science of it. How, yeah. how, do, these, how do these aromas get into wine? How does a green pepper smell get into the grape? <sighs> It's just like, it, I mean, obviously they're not putting anything else in the wine except the grape. It's just a characteristic. A lot of it comes from the skin of the grape. Um, there are hundreds, thousands of different grape varieties. Um, and they've morphed and they've naturally crossed or humans have crossed. There's just so many. And they have different components in their skin. I haven't done the actual like scientific research. I've just known what scientific people have told me and I've studied, but it, it, for whatever reason, some have components of pyrazine or another one is rotundin. Those are, that's in Syrah a lot. Um, it has like a black olive pepper quality. I don't know who named what component, what, but I just memorize them now, <laughs> but it is, if you get that, that wine, you can get, like, I get black olive or green olive off of Syrah a lot. Um, and they just had, it's like people, right? Some people have a skin color that's slightly, or eye color, it's slightly different. It's like grapes are the same. They all have like slight differences. And then people study them and try to break it down in a way that we can separate and understand and so further study. I will, I want to pivot back for a moment to the career transition. So yeah. You're working at the restaurant, a wine mm -hmm. rep plants the idea in your head, and then you think, okay, let me, let me study this. Now, how, at, at what point did you tell the story about how you made the leap from no longer being a server to being a sommelier? And I know this, we might be covering a lot of ground here. So go right ahead. What, yeah. uh, what were the steps? Um, so yeah, I, like I said, I was out of work for about six months. I, I signed up for, through the quartermaster sommeliers for the introductory the level one SOM, which is easy. If anyone's interested in wine, I'd actually recommend it. Uh, you they send you a book, it's a relatively, it's like two, 300 pages, but it's got like lots of pictures and maps and things like that. So you can get through it. Um, and as long as you read that book and study it, I think it's fairly simple to pass. Um, you go for a two day course. They also break down the beginnings of blind tasting, which is helpful. And you get to taste some wines. Uh, and, and then at the end of the two day class, you take the test. Uh, and then that's it for level one. Now, level two uh, is the same format as what you saw in the SOM documentary. We'll do blind tasting theory and a service for the masters. Same for level three and level four, which is master. It just gets harder every time. Um, and so I knew I wanted to take my certified. I knew I wanted to, to be uh, a SOM. So I, I found a restaurant that had an amazing wine program, which is where I am now still 71 above. Um, and so when I first started, I was a server, but I told them, you know, I, I have my level one SOM I'm studying to take my level two, which is the certified. And, you know, I have just a great mentor. Catherine Morrill runs the program at 71 and she helped, you know, 
kind of train me for that, which I'm lucky because a lot of people just have to self train and they don't get to work with like a 800 plus bottle list of all these classic wines. And right, But I think this is a good example of, of, you know, if you follow your bliss, the angels will show up, you know, you, Oh say, my gosh. I, I will say that a hundred percent. Um, cause even with like the writing now that I do like the wine writing, uh, if anyone who's done acting or comedy or anything, you know, that it's like banging your head against the wall. And it's not that I don't, still love it like I still have an agent like once in a while I go on a commercial audition whatever um but I just got to the point where you know you go on every audition you go on every open mic you go and like it started to get draining and then it was like I dipped a toe into wine and it was like everything was blowing up and I was like okay and so yeah my first and only floor restaurant som job is at 71 above i've been there three and a half years now like i said i started as a server um but then i made the transition they were giving me like shifts here and there as a som but i still served and then once i got my certified i did like more and then soon people left whatever happened and now i'm a full-time Saw him there. Now I'm actually about to be the lead song there because another girl took a job in Montana. So that kind Montana, of was the, the, uh, the uh, other wine capital of the world. Yeah. <laughs> well, they're building a montage in big sky and it's very fancy. So it's very good for her. <laughs> uh, talk, talk for a minute about your very first time on the floor as a song. Were you oh, yeah, so Were you going, oh, this is it. Some guy is going to ask me which red goes with the prime rib and I'm going to screw it up. And I'm never going to get this chance again. How did, what was that day like? Well, the scariest part is, and what you should know about, like, this is going to go for pretty much any restaurant who has a big list. Um, the Psalms have not tried every wine on the list. So it's, it would cost the restaurant way too much money. They're not going to open every bottle up. So you have to rely on theory. And this is why we study all the weird, intricate facts and this and that. Because if you're going to ask me, hey, what's the difference between these three wines and they're all cabs, but they're all maybe a different year vintage or they're a different, you know, AVA, which is the Appalachian where it's grown. Even if I haven't tasted the wine, I should be able to tell you, oh, well this year was cooler. So it's going to be a little more fresh and crisp or this year was warmer. So it's going to be more fruit forward or it, in Napa, you know, there's four, there's the hill hilltops, like Spring Mountain, Howell Mountain, it's higher elevation. And then there's Rutherford, which is the valley floor. So technically I should be able to tell you the difference between those wines without tasting them just based on theory. Then there's always that moment though, when you sell something to somebody that you've never tried before and you're opening and you're like, I hope I'm right. <laughs> I hope I'm right. But it, it does, it works out most of the time. Now, do you find customers, are they, now, you know more than the customer does, 99.9% .9 of the time, obviously, but are, are customers full of crap that they go, you know what, you're absolutely right, I can taste the the tannins or whatever. I mean, or are they playing along or do they really get what you're talking about? I mean, for the most part, people don't know the terms that I would use. I, I don't talk in super technical terms when I'm talking to a guest, I try to find what they like. I find the hardest part is most people don't know how to describe what they like. Um, Not just in food. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, because a lot of people think that they're like, well, I don't want something too dry, right? But the, the reality is if you're having a red wine, most of them are dry, technically dry, even though, unless you're getting a dessert wine or whatever, but there are wines, which I say have an illusion of sweetness, which is like a Paso Robles or like a Napa Valley where the fruit is super ripe. Uh, but it's technically dry, but it's fruitier, right? So I can try to lead someone that way. If they say they want sweet red, um, there are exceptions to the rule, like jam jar that you can buy at the grocery store, or like Stella Rosa, but a lot of nice, like most high-end restaurants aren't going to have that kind of stuff on the list. So I try to go by what they tell me they like and guide them to something similar. But once in a while, it'll happen where somebody will describe something that they like. Like they'll be like, I want a full bodied, you know, fruity wine. And I might bring them a taste of Napa Cab and they're like, oh no. And then they end up liking Pinot Noir, which is like the lightest bodied like driest mm -hmm. so sometimes you know you just gotta kind of read between the lines with people to figure out what they want 
Yeah, yeah, I'm not nearly that savvy. I do go, I belong to a winery called Moonstone up the coast in Cambria. Okay. And um, I go tasting there once in a while with friends of mine. Sometimes I'll go with my mother. And every red I taste, I do the swirl, I do the smell, I swish mm-hmm. it around. And every time I go, peppery, that's the best I got. I'm not, I don't have a sophisticated palate. I have had a terrible nose my whole life. No, it's not. It's not broken. I just don't, it's gotta be overpowering for me to get the aroma. Are yeah. you saying you could train a person like me? I think so, yeah. I mean, unless your nose is like completely, like actually stuffy that you can't breathe. But yes, if, if you can breathe and smell, I could train you, yes. Okay, I might I might just start training myself. I might just get a handful, of, like onions I get, but like yeah. peppers, that would take some doing. Maybe yeah. I'll cut up a pepper and just sniff the hell out of it and just see what my try to get fluent in the language because that's fascinating to me. I will say I've gotten better. So now I also work at Wine and Spirits. I'm the domestic tasting coordinator. And so now I'm literally tasting two to 300 wines a week. Um, And I have noticed that my tasting notes have gotten much more creative because then you're trying to figure out different ways to describe so many wines. I can't just say cherry, raspberry, every single one, you know? So uh, I actually feel like my tasting notes have gotten stronger uh, the more more I taste. But I'll tell you, everyone thinks it's fun to taste wine every day. But my tongue, like all the acid and the tannins and everything, it it hurts after a while. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. How how? You know, I don't want you to slag other psalms, but I saw a story years ago on 2020 or one of those shows when Charles Shaw first came out. Okay. For people who don't know Charles Shaw, it's called Two Buck Chuck. I think it's three bucks now, but it's it's made of leftover grapes. It's kind of the spam of red wine. Yeah. White wine. It's made of a lot of leftovers and it's serviceable. That's the most you can say for it. So they did a blind taste test with Charles Shaw and a bunch of other, you know, high-end stuff, low-end stuff. And they went to these experts in New York. I don't know if they were Psalms or, or just chefs, but people who knew things about wine. And half of them totally blew it on Charles Shaw. They thought it was some high-end thing from California, you know, you know, and they blew it. They thought, oh, this must cost $30 a bottle. Nope, sorry, it's garbage. And they were fooled by it. Do you, do you think, I mean, how often could something like that actually happen? Do you think this was uh, played up for the TV or do you think wine experts blow it from time to time? If you I can... mean, listen, it's possible that people can blow it at any point. I would love to do this. I would, I would be shocked. I don't mean to sound cocky, but I would be shocked if I couldn't tell the difference between the Charles Shaw and something else. And I'll tell you why. It's not even necessarily the, the flavor. Um, and this is what we were talking about a little bit earlier was, um, you know, is it is it opinion on if a wine is good or bad or, you know, is there actual science? So the thing is, everybody's taste buds are different, right? Um so what I might like is different than what you like. And that doesn't mean that the wine's bad, but I can tell structurally if the wine is bad. And what I mean by structurally is the acid content, the tannin content, the body, does it have a like mid body? Does it have a finish? Like things like that. How does it feel in my mouth? Is it clunky? Does it feel like they used wood chips? Cause cheaper wine, they'll take literally a tea bag of wood chips because they can't afford the oak because otherwise the wine would have to cost more. So oh, this is make, like this is like Taco Bell meat. So they're literally going to take a tea bag of oak chips and like steep it in the wine. And it's going to have a different consistency and flavor than if it's actually naturally aged in an oak barrel. And if you taste enough of that structurally, you can tell the difference. The wine might not even taste bad. Listen, there are, we do a bargain buy section all the time of $20 and under wines. And there's some good ones. I mean, there's a lot of terrible ones, but there's some good ones. But I will say even the good ones of the bargain buys structurally feel different in my mouth and have a different, the way the acid sits. Fun thing, if you ever drink wine, the way you can tell the acid, once you switch swish it around your mouth, like kind of drop your head forward and the amount of acid that like rushes to the front, that'll tell you if it is medium, medium plus or high acid. Interesting. Thank you for that. And by the way, I do pride myself. I could tell Charles Shaw. The last time I had Charles Shaw, it went down like water. I'm going, yeah. this is not right for wine. It, it could taste fine, I'm sure. But like, yeah, you, structurally, I would think that you could tell the difference. That's, that's the part that makes sense. And, you know, let's, I want to go off on this tangent for a minute because this is fascinating to me. I liken this to being a movie critic. 
Mm-hmm. Because there are people who might like popular movies, but a critic can go, no, structurally, this screenplay doesn't make sense. Or this yeah. director had a lampshade on his head when he made these shots and things like that. So that's an interesting compare and contrast also. Um, I don't know where I'm going with that. I just find that it, it's it's interesting to hear you talk about how wine is, yes, it's subjective, but it's also objective. There are some certain things that are universally agreed upon that make good wines. Yeah, like for wine and spirits, like there are certain grapes that I enjoy personally more than others, but we still taste them all, right? So I personally don't love a big buttery Chardonnay, but there are people who love that and it's a great style. And so when I'm tasting Chardonnay, I can't only recommend the super lean, crisp stainless steel wines. I have to also recommend the big buttery nutty Chardonnays, but then you have to look at it like, okay, I might not personally drink this, but is it a good wine? Is it structurally good? Is, you know, would people enjoy it? Is it balanced? And then those wines would still get a good score, even if I might not personally drink it. It's like, you know, horror movies. Not everybody's jam, but a well-written <laughs> yeah. horror movie is undeniable. Yeah. Um, how did you get the job for uh, writing for Wine and Spirits magazine? Well, that's what we were, we were talking about this earlier too, about like how things just happen. I literally, it's, insane. Uh, I started studying for the Psalm stuff. And then I was like, oh, maybe I'd want to write in a write for a magazine. The first article I ever pitched was to spirituality and health didn't have to do with wine. But I literally pitched my first article and it got published. Then I was like, okay, I think I want to write a wine one. So then I pitched one article to wine enthusiast, which is now my competitor. Uh, but it got published. Like it was like insane. Like I, I was two for two. I was like, everyone says, Oh, when you pitch, you know, articles, you're going to get so many rejections and this and that. And I would just was like, it's magic. Um, and then I was like, okay, cool. And I was like, well, how else can I write more for, for wine? And I joined this Psalm group during the pandemic where we were doing tastings virtually and you know so we could still practice like blind tasting we could still have master classes it was a really cool uh cool thing and I was on the leadership group and and I was like okay well how can I reach out and find out who writes about wine within this group and so I literally reached out randomly to uh Patrick Kamik- Patrick Kamikski, who is our lead critic out here in in Los Angeles. And I was like, Hey, I'd love to just chat with you about how you became a wine writer. And he wrote back right away. And he's like, well, actually I need some tasters, uh, for the Riesling issue. You know, do you want to come taste? And then we can chat about this in between. I'm like, sure. So I went, I tasted with him and he, at the time it was in his (laughs) backyard at his house and he was like you know we actually closed down the office because of the pandemic but we're reopening it now uh and we're going to need somebody to run the tasting department and I was like oh yeah I was like I'd totally be into that and so came around um I interviewed I think some other people interviewed too but I sent in like a couple samples that I had I also had worked on writing my own wine blog during the pandemic. So I had the two pieces I had published in magazines, plus like my wine blog, uh, articles. And so I submitted all that and then I got the job and then I, uh, have been orchestrating many, many tastings. I basically taste all the domestic wines. The New York office does all the international lines, but I do all the domestic here in LA. And then I also get to write pieces for, the magazine. My first one was in the October issue. I did a, a article about Psalms and how the, the position of Psalms is changing or not changing post pandemic. Um, and then for the top 100 winery issue, I got to write a couple of the profiles on different wineries and I got to interview the winemakers, which is really cool. And then just recently I uh, did my first restaurant review, which is super cool. Um, I did the girl and the goat, which is an amazing restaurant downtown. If you haven't gone try. Um, but so, yeah, I just, I get to do like little, all the little writing things. And then I also get to taste a lot of wine. So it's so far so good. I don't know if that's the normal route, but like, you know what? I don't think there is such a thing as a normal route. I think you ask anybody in, I mean, unless they're, you know, a doctor where you have to go to med school and be a resident, all that. 
I don't think there's a normal route, especially for a creative. I mean, you're a creative, obviously, and you've got this passion and this other thing that isn't yeah. a performing art. No, there's no roadmap for any of this. And you know something yeah. else I've realized and reminded myself this year? Colleges never teach you how to quit a job. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no. It's all about make the resume bigger. Here's how you get a promotion. Blah, 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 blah. Glad yeah. handing and resume. and blah, blah, blah. No, just how about if a job sucks and you want to leave? What do we do yeah. then? How about if yeah. you want to do something else? Just go for it. So I think it's a great example of somebody pursuing what they want to pursue and, you know, the unit, the planets align for it. One last question. What, yeah. I don't expect you to convert people into sommeliers in an interview in a few minutes, but what takeaways can the average wine drinker, like a guy like me wandering through Trader Joe's, what can you tell me, avoid this, get that or, or whatever. Are there any little things that the average wine buyer can do next time they go to the store? One thing I will say, this isn't necessarily a tip, but, uh, I really like the wine selection at Whole Foods. If you're going to buy wine at a grocery store, I would say try Whole Foods if there's one around you, um, just because they have a program that's run by like the actual sommeliers. Um, and so their selection is good and they have some good value for money, um, more so than Ralph's or Trader Joe's, in my opinion, this is my opinion. Don't add us, everybody. <laughs> it's just her opinion. But um, but you can find good stuff also at Ralph's or Trader Joe's or any wine uh, store. What I would say, I urge people to experiment. I know nobody wants to pay a ton of money. I'm not saying go out and buy $50 bottles for every bottle. But if you're currently buying an $8 or $9 bottle, maybe creep up to $15. If you're buying the two buck chuck, like creep up to $8. I don't know. I do think that you are going to have a different wine experience. Cause like I said, it, to keep it in those lower price points, they're doing things like steeping it in wood chips. They're growing huge mass quantities of grapes. Like for high end wine, they actually cut grapes off the vine because the more the vine has to work, the less flavorful the grapes are the flavors aren't as concentrated so literally i've gone to vineyards during like growing season and they're cutting whole clusters off of vines they only want three clusters per branch so that those ones are really concentrated but when you're getting the cheaper ones it's like grow as much as you can and they're more like watered down like the charles shaw there's not as much structure they're cutting corners to make it cheaper so i would say push it just a little bit you might notice some differences and and that's always fun but if you're looking for value i would say stay away from napa stay away from because they're to get good napa it's expensive it's going to be 50 bucks if you're getting like a 20 it's probably not going to be the best the reason is land is the most expensive of anywhere in california it's the most expensive in Napa, which is why then the wines are more expensive. But if you were looking at a, a place like the Santa Barbara is like coming up more and more, but like Santa Barbara, uh, you can get like equally, if not better wines for a lower price point, uh, in my opinion, or if you go, okay, the best is for Europe, Italy and places in France that are not Burgundy or Bordeaux, you can find amazing value um for for what you're getting uh, i would go for um chinon is a region in the loire valley that makes cabernet franc you can get a chinon at whole foods i i don't know about uh trader joe's but for like 15 18 bucks chinon can you spell that i'll put that yeah in it's c h i n o n okay the hard thing about italian or french wine is they don't put the grape on the label they only ever put the the village or the like appellation name it's why <laughs> i joke it's why i have a job is because of the frenchman like any bottle you look at it's gonna say burgundy it's gonna have like the the village it's from or in bordeaux it's just gonna have like you know saint emilion or it, it's never gonna say this is merlot this is cab um so it's, that's the only hard part about shopping for these, but I would say anything from Loire, like Chinon, um, Sancerre is great. If you've heard of the Sancerre, white Sancerre is Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, red Sancerre is rare, but that's Pinot Noir. Uh, but uh, Sancerre is probably 18, 
20 bucks, really high quality wine. Chinon, again from Loire, Cabernet Franc, high quality wine, because they can't compete with Bordeaux, right? So they have to keep the prices down. The land's less expensive. There's a lot of factors into it. I mean, once in a while- These are French and Italian wines that can be found in stores locally. Oh yeah, yeah. You could find Sancerre in almost any store. You can definitely find Chinon in almost any store. Um, For Italian wine, I go look for something from like Sicily or um, like Alto Adige has a lot of weird grapes like Lagrine and, and Chiava, things that you might never have heard of, but they're going to be lower price points. They're going to be $15, $18 because they don't have the marketing that Cabernet Sauvignon, everybody wants Cabernet Sauvignon, but then you're paying for it. So I would say if you can experiment with other things that you don't know, you're going to find some really fun things for a lesser value. I'm going to do it. Uh, now, these are are these kinds of are these makers or are these regions? She, she they're, they're mostly regions. I'm because right. there's there's so many different producers and I don't know what each store carries. People okay. are always like, tell me a brand. I'm like, I would rather tell you a region and then find that that region. There's the hack, everybody. Don't look at don't look at the maker. Look at the region. That's I mean, the there's hack. like occasionally people that are terrible but some of those smaller regions it's going to be a bigger company that's getting exported here anyway it's not going to be a super small doesn't know what they're doing company so it's cool. usually pretty safe thank you very much for that and thanks for the interview congratulations on dipping a toe in the water and having the whole yeah. universe open up to you yeah i, I feel very lucky and grateful so that's <laughs> the way it works i think you did it right i think that's the way it works and i think it's you know it, it happened when it was supposed to happen and yeah. getting fired is a blessing sometimes so next time you get fired everybody maybe it's <laughs> you never know and you work at 71 above that's let me guess 71st floor of is it the library building no, it's the U.S. Bank Tower downtown. That's it. I've seen pictures. Everyone likes to post pictures of themselves having dinner there where they have it's the, gorgeous. the yeah. view. So yeah. if you're in L.A., go to 71 Above. Yeah. Get a wine. Treat yourself. Yeah. yeah. All right, Elisa Bika, thank you so much. Thank you. Talk to you soon. Okay. Pick her up. Tell her we're clear. <laughs> you can, you can, I, you, okay, uh, someone will drive her home. Isn't she cool? Huh? She's just living her life. She's going... I want to do that. And then there it is. I apologize for the lighting. She did her best. She said she was having a bit of an issue with the lighting, the way things were in her in her apartment with the light coming in and, you know, whatever. I mean, production design has never been my long and strong suit. Know what I mean? Uh, also, that was kind of cool. The little tips she gave about what the average person can do when they're shopping for wine. Regions. It's all about location. Location, location, location. Where were where the grapes from? Where do you live? Where are you going to buy property? Where is your head, yo?